Happy holidays from the bridge. This is Rick Jones, your host and captain. Today we're going to talk about a new sponsorship arena to our agency and an opportunity for others going forward, and that's the sponsorships of historical venues. We have been hired by the American Battlefields Trust to develop a corporate sponsorship program for the Liberty Trail and the Southern Campaign of the Revolutionary War, all leading up to the 250th anniversary of America in 2026. I'm thrilled to have the recently retired president of the American Battlefields Trust, Jim Lighthizer, with us today to tell us his story and the story of the ABT and how they save sacred battlefield land throughout our country. We'll take a couple of trips, one up on the soapbox and one to another great restaurant on the road with Rick. I've always loved history. My kids have accused me of taking them to every battlefield, every castle, every museum, you name it, both here in America and places throughout the world. I like to read historical novels. I like to watch historical movies and documentaries. One of my favorite filmmakers is Ken Burns, uh, and I have a Ken Burns story for you. Uh, Boy, it's been nearly 30 years ago. And I had given a speech at the International Events Group Annual Conference, the IEG Conference. Y'all may remember a previous episode where we talked to Lisa Eukman. And I was fortunate to go every year and do a workshop at IEG. And after I did my workshop, a woman came up to me named Lynn Novick. And Lynn said, hey, Rick, you don't know me, but I work for a filmmaker named Ken Burns at Florentine Films, and we need help finding corporate underwriting for our films. And so I had the privilege of flying to Burlington, Vermont, and getting in my car on a blistery winter day, driving to Ken Burns Farm in Wapal, New Hampshire, and I got to spend the day with him. Now, he had done nine films. The first film he ever did was a film called The Brooklyn Bridge. And then he did a film on Teddy Roosevelt and a number of other people. But he had a big, big film series coming out called The Civil War. And you may remember the great haunting fiddle tune to The Civil War that sets that thing apart. Well, Ken was looking for underwriting partners for that. Um, And, um, He said, I'd like to hire you to find me corporate sponsorships. And about a week later, he called me and said, hey, I got some good news for me and some bad news from you. The good news for me is that I've just done a 10-picture deal with General Motors, and they're going to be an exclusive. And I think General Motors may have paid him as much as $100 million uh, for the 10 films. Um, But that's my Ken Burns story. Uh, But even make it even more special, before I left Walpole, New Hampshire that day, Ken Burns gave me a box set that had not even come out yet of the DVDs of, uh, in fact, they weren't DVDs, they were VHS of the Civil War. And uh, I still have that collection today that's, uh, that's very important to me. So I've got, I've got a fond place in my heart for, uh, for history. I, I also remember the great campaign that American Express did to raise funds for the restoration of Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty. That was a wonderful campaign. It was one of the first what we call calls marketing campaigns. Um, And it was that intersection of sponsorship and calls. And that's what really sponsorship of historical venues can do. I'd like to see more corporations support historical venues and museums and history lessons. I find that too many Americans simply don't know the history of our country or the history of the world. And there's wisdom in learning from the past and celebrating and honoring those who came before us. If you don't know the past, you're probably destined to repeat the past. We are very excited about the Liberty Trail Project. We have firstly developed a sponsorship plan. You know, we've talked about this all the time. You plan your work and work your plan. So we went through the exercise that we do in all our properties, the architectural and engineering process of building a sponsorship plan. And that plan includes various assets for our corporate partners. These include physical places like actual battlefields, like national parks and state parks, 
The program also includes school teacher kits, picnic activity books, a dedicated website, and a mobile app, along with media partnerships for print, digital, social, radio, and television products, plus a special merchandise program and special events, and a whole, whole lot more. We're excited about now starting the solicitation and sales process for the Liberty Trail. We've just come out of a very contentious presidential election, And I'm hoping that the 250th anniversary of America, which is just around the corner, five years from now, it can be something that brings us back together. We can celebrate our commonalities. We can celebrate the fact that Mr. Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, that all men and now all women are created equal, and that all of us have the ability to strive for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness And we're thinking that the small thing that we can do with the Liberty Trail will help bring all of us back together again. My special guest, Jim Lighthizer, has spent his professional life in protecting land where Americans fought and died in the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, and the Civil War. Jim was the longtime president of the American Battlefields Trust, which was formerly named the Civil War Trust. He retired just this past September and turned over the reins to his longtime development director, David Duncan. But he remains on the ABT Board of Trustees and will continue to oversee the development of the Liberty Trail. Let's welcome Jim to the bridge. Jim, we're glad to have you today with us from the bridge. Rick, thanks for having me. I'm I'm looking forward to this interview. Well, let's talk about the American Battlefields Trust, and and, and let's tell our listeners exactly what the organization does. Okay, the American Battlefield Trust, which, by the way, has had several names over the last 21 years, but... Uh, is an organization membership-based. We have uh, nearly 50,000 members around the country uh, whose mission is to preserve the places where America was created and defined and then tell in an unbiased way what happened there and why it matters today. And what I mean by that is that we we focus on the real estate side in preserving the battlefields or parts of the battlefields of the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, and, of course, the Great American Civil War. Because those are the places where first this country was created and then later defined as the, as the kind of country we are today, which is essentially, essentially saying an organ, uh, a, a, a country that is committed to liberty. Uh, So we save those places, but more than just save the real estate and preserve it and restore it to the way it looked at the time of the battle when the history happened. But we tell the story of what happened there. And as I said, why it matters today. You know, that's sacred land. Uh, That's places where Americans fought and in many cases even even died. Um, Talk about why that's so important. Well, if you think about America— the United States of America now, it is, it's, it's the oldest democratic republic in the history of the world. And I would argue that it is the most successful experiment in human self-governance in world history. Now, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a tall statement. But let, let me tell you why I say that. Uh, this country was created on ideals that at the time were revolutionary. And that is that all men and women, of course, were created equal and that they were endowed with certain inalienable rights, rights they had to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Now, that was revolutionary at the time. Heck, in some places, in fact, most of the world is still revolutionary. But it didn't happen by accident. It happened because ordinary men and women, citizen soldiers, if you will, quit the job they were doing for a period of time to put their life on the line for the principles they believed in. Now, 
that if it's not unique in world history, it's certainly very, very unusual. And if, if you look at the history of this country, particularly the early years, the first hundred years, if you will, you, you had people that were farmers and shopkeepers and, and barrel makers and, and iron workers that who stopped what they were doing, left their families and went and joined the army and fought. And, and, it, and many of them lost their lives as a consequence. And you say, well, why did they do that? Because almost all of them were volunteers. They didn't have to do this. It was because they believed in a certain set of principles, and, and they were willing to put their life on the line. Then they went back, after they were successful, to their other job, went back to being ordinary citizens again. I mean, that's just so special. And, and you know, as I said, our liberty, what we are today, it, it, it didn't happen by accident. I mean, it, it happened because of those citizen soldiers, period. And, and Americans have to know that story, Rick. And, and, you know, democracy, as President Reagan said, isn't passed from one generation to another through osmosis. It's, picked, it's passed because one generation who knows the true story tells the next generation. And that generation is in turn inspired. Uh, and that's what we do. We tell the stories where America was created and defined, why it matters today. One of the greatest stories, by the way, ever told. Well, I, I know when I go to battlefields, when I go to Gettysburg or I go to Yorktown or I go to F Fort McHenry, y you feel the ghost. I mean, you do. I mean, you, you look at the land, the calmness, and realize, you know, something – monumental happened here. I, I, earlier on the show today, I talked about Ken Burns, and I remember that first opening in the Civil War with the the great fiddle tune that, that just defines that entire thing, and it's the letter that a Union soldier wrote home to his wife, and it was the last letter he wrote, uh, yeah. and, he, and he died. And, and the letter of, you know, when the wind hits your cheek— it will be me, and I think about the battlefields when you when you when you go there in the calmness and the stillness, and the wind blows. You you realize, in, in my opinion, this it's sacred land, and and it doesn't deserve to be a, a shopping mall or a parking lot. And and y'all have stopped a lot of that from happening. Yes, we have, and I might add a great expense. You know we. We saved a piece of ground, 15 acres up in Princeton, New Jersey, the exact place where, where George Washington led the counterattack at the Battle of Princeton. Uh, and it, it cost us $5 million for 15 acres. But you know something, Rick? It was worth it because that was one of the pivotal times, not just in American history, but in world history. And we saved that ground where George Washington was. And, and, you know, we just happen to think that's incredibly important that Americans come, come there and stand where he stood and, and, and visualize what happened at that pivotal time in American history in 1777. Uh, you know, it's just amazing because, you know, land is something that, you know, once it's developed, it's lost. I mean, yep. it's it's very difficult to come back in and say, all right, we're going to tear down a subdivision or we're going to tear down an interstate highway or we're going to tear down you know, a shopping mall. And I think sometimes Americans don't realize, again, you know, Joni Mitchell had a great song back in the 60s. They paved paradise and put up a parking lot. And we we don't realize that once we've lost that land, we're not going to reclaim it. Exactly, and and remember what that land is is hollowed ground. It, it's it's part of a, the, how America was created and defined. Uh, it's places where people fought and died for what they believed in, but it's also a teaching tool. It, it's a place we can go and know something authentic and extremely important happened there. And I'm standing where they stood, and I'm seeing what they saw in terms of the landscape. And, and, and if you know the story of what happened there, you can learn something. And if you, if you learn it, because as I said, I, I think the American story is one of the greatest stories ever told, you'll be inspired. Because, you know, as I said, uh, the democracy doesn't happen by accident, and it doesn't stay democracy by accident. Every generation 
more or less has to step up and do their part. And and if you don't believe that what you're doing is important and part of a continuum, it's a heck of a lot harder to do. Well, you know, every society has faults, but in the history of mankind, we were the first country, you know, in, in previous, I mean, if you go back to biblical times, the rule of thumb was, I kill you, I take your stuff. <laughs> I mean, I kill you, I take, yeah. your, I take your wives, I take your children, I take your cattle, I take your land. We're the only country that in the Second World War, not only did we not take their stuff through the Marshall Plan, we rebuilt their countries. Yeah. Who does that? Yeah. Nobody, Nobody does that. No, only Nobody us. That. Yeah. And, and you talk about the foundations of our principles Again, it didn't happen by osmosis, as you said. It was because previous generations understood what our value system was. You know, the thing to remember, Rick, particularly in this day and age, when so many people are critical of America, is that first, we're, we're by definition a country of human beings, which means we're imperfect. But the thing to remember about America is that we're always in the process of striving to become better, to, to improve. To, to become perfect, knowing you're never going to get there. You know, humans are not capable of perfection. Only God is. But but we can try, and we do. And if you look at the history of this country, it's it, it's it's not a straight line, but but it's a zigzag line. But it is always ultimately headed towards making this a better country for all Americans, all citizens. I remember the great story. And again, I'm a son of the South. I, I, I was raised in Atlanta. I had a great grandfather that fought at Chickamauga and Lookout Mountain. But I remember the great story of the the gesture of Grant with Lee at Appomattox, where he said, "Keep your your your, your sidearms." You know, and 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 as the Southern troops, the defeated Southern troops left, the Federal troops saluted them. I mean, yeah. you know, we're at a point we got to remember those stories in America. When we're divided, we need to begin to remember things like forgiveness and redemption uh, and connectivity. I, I think we have more in common than we have differences, and yet we don't seem to celebrate our commonalities anymore. No, we we don't, and and obviously as a, as a nation, and and listen, there's no more diverse country in the world than the United States of America. If you think of 330 million people, and essentially we're a nation of immigrants, and we come from literally all over the world, and and they're literally uh, dying to get in. I mean, it's the most desirable place to live, and it's for one for a couple of reasons. One is its opportunity, but the ultimate reason is freedom. You can be whatever the heck you want to be if you work hard. And that appeals to, to humanity. And it's, it, as I said, the story, when you think about it, it gives me the goosebumps that this this place, you know, I don't know how many, six billion people, whatever there is in the world, 330 million of them, you know, most, most of the rest of the world is trying to get here or would if they could. Uh, and it's because of freedom. Because of opportunity, uh, as I said, it didn't happen by accident. No, it, it didn't. You know, um, you know. Speaking of that, how, how did you first get involved? How, you know, you 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 had a previous career. How did you get involved with the ABT? Well, I'm a, amongst other things, I'm a recovering politician. I was uh, an elected and appointed office in Maryland for 16 years, and most of those jobs were executive jobs. I was a mayor of a county and transportation secretary for maryland and, and for some reason i can't tell you why rick i i really loved preserving land uh in in the case of those jobs it was natural land some history land uh but i, I just i don't i guess it's in my dna and of course the other thing that's in my dna is i love american history i just love particularly biographies and uh 
when I got this, uh, I was practicing law at the time when they offered me this job. I didn't say yes. I said, hell yes. Uh, I took a pay cut and was happy to do it because it gave me a chance to combine my two passions in life. One was American history and two, saving uh, saving land. And when you could save the land where American history happens, to me, it, it doesn't get any better than that. I mean, that's ice cream gone to heaven. So uh, that's how I got involved with this. Well, when I read the book of the kind of the history of how the American Battlefields Trust, first the Civil War Trust, became uh, an organization and some of the pioneers that, you know, it's funny. I I live in Charleston, South Carolina, and, you know, in in the 1920s, they they were about to tear down all these historic homes. And a group of little old ladies said, whoa, 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 what, what, what are you doing? Had they not done that, you know, Charleston might look like every other coastal city instead of the historic city that we had. Uh, when you became the leader uh, of, of, of an organization that had kind of started but really had not developed, what, what did you did you make your top priority? What, you know, you, you had a lot to do. How did, how did you, how did you kind of prioritize the needs? Well, first it, it was December 19. Or, yes. It was December, 1999. We, we were the product uh, then called the civil War preservation trust. Now the American battlefield trust, we were a product of a merger of two other organizations, uh, one of which had been in existence 13 years. And uh, so I had the first mill two cultures, uh, and they were different. But the number one priority was to keep us afloat. We were $7 million in debt. And uh, uh, the old proverbial expression that we didn't have a pot to pee in or a window to throw it out of was really true with us. Uh, so the first thing was I had to figure out a way to keep us financially afloat. And, and the second thing I had to do was uh, priority uh, was uh, was change the culture of the organization. Uh, and we were fortunate and able to do that. Well, we're so pleased to be working with the organization on the Liberty Trail. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, I again, I, I'm a son of the South. I think we've never told the story of the Southern campaign of the Revolutionary War, largely because we lost the Civil War. And a lot of times I think winners write history. But, you know, there was such a great campaign in the southern part of the country tied to the revolution that ultimately led to our victory. Talk a little bit about that. Well, you know, it's it's I I tell people that the southern campaign, which is 1780, 1781, uh, in largely South Carolina, is a story that nobody knows. And, and, and it's a story where you can certainly make a very strong argument the Revolutionary War was won, and nobody knows it. You know, I told Governor McMaster's once, I said, you're, you're governor of South Carolina, I said, you, you know, you, you all spend all your time talking about the Civil War, and that's great because that's the area I work hard in, but but you don't say anything about the war you won. You talk about the war you lost. You got to talk about the Revolutionary War where South Carolina literally was pivotal in us winning our independence. You know, when you... You, you, you can't have a civil war unless you you got a country, and that's where our country was defined. So when we got into the environment, we were, as you implied, we were primarily a civil war battlefield preservation organization uh, up until about five years ago. When we got into the rev, what I call the rev war business, preserving revolutionary uh, war land, battlefield land, uh, I looked around the country, and, and, and I noticed that in South Carolina there was some incredible history that wasn't preserved, and nobody knew, or very few people knew anything about. So I started reading up on it and talking to people, historians, and, and realized here was an opportunity to go in and save a series of battles that nobody knows anything about is a practical matter. To this is the 99th percentile. And we can preserve that history land, which is legitimate, where the country was created, and tell the story. Of what happened there and why it matters today, and so that's what we started doing about three years ago. And and we're we're buying places quite candidly because I'm primarily a Civil War guy as far as what I read that that I didn't know have any idea about places like Waxhaw's Massacre and and uh, and you know Kings Mountain and Cowpens and heck some of them are national parks but I didn't know anything about them and I think most Americans don't. But but what we want to do is is 
is preserve those places and is that create a trail because most of these battlefields in the Rev War, Revolutionary War, are, are relatively small compared to the Civil War. The Civil War battlefield could be 10,000 acres. And, and the Revolutionary War a, a battlefield, a significant battlefield, can be 200 acres. And, and you, you can get your arms around 200 acres. You can, you can afford to buy that and preserve it. Uh, 10,000 is a little taller order. Uh, but uh, so that's what we're doing. We're, 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 we're buying the land the, uh, where historic battles happen that nobody knows anything about. And we're doing the research so we can tell the story of what happened there and, and tie them all together. And I'll tell you, Rick, when, when we're done, and we've still got a ways to go, uh, we'll be working on this for a while. But, but when we're done or while we're doing it, we're going to be able to tell a story that, 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 that the vast majority of Americans, when they hear it and when they go there, are going to say, I didn't know that. My, that's important. Well, I think we do. I think there's so many things historically we just don't know. And if you don't know history, you're destined to repeat the the, the mistakes of the past and you, you just don't learn from it. I, I did a little informal poll that that was just astonishing. I went to a bunch of my South Carolina football fans. And none of them knew why they're called the Gamecocks. Yeah. They didn't yeah. know. They didn't know that Thomas Sumter, who fought like a Gamecock, and the British said he fights like a Gamecock, he won't quit. Uh, that's the name of the state university mascot. They did not know that. I mean, <laughs> yeah. that, 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 that it blows my mind. But it shows we, we, we got to do some things to educate people in South Carolina and around the country in what we did, what we believe, where we fought, um, who our heroes were. Um, and, and I'm excited about that, uh, the ability to, to tell those stories here in our state. Rick, and this is not not just North, uh, South Carolina, but the United States of America. Our knowledge of history uh, is is appalling. It's so bad. Uh, you know, I've read studies. You've read studies, but uh, it's if you get under age forty five, it's it's amazing what what people don't know about their country that are that age or younger, and and that's dangerous. That's dangerous. Uh, it, because if people don't know who they are and why they are the way they are, uh, and, and they don't know their traditions, their history, they don't know their culture, and they don't appreciate their culture. And uh, it, it, that's very dangerous for a democracy. I'll tell you one quick little story. Benjamin Franklin, when he was coming out of the Constitutional Convention, when they just finished up writing the Constitution, we're going to send to the states for ratification. It was in August uh, uh, I think it was 1787. A lady asked him, said, what is it? Because they'd been meeting in secret, the delegates. Is it a monarchy or a republic? And he said to her, Mrs. Powell was her name. He said, Mrs. Powell, it's a republic if you can keep it. And, and those words to me are profound, uh, what Benjamin Franklin said that day, because every generation has got a choice to make whether they're going to keep this democracy or not. And if you don't know your history, and if you don't appreciate your culture, chances are you may not keep it. And that's scary stuff. It is. I'm heartened, though, that we have the 250th anniversary of America coming in 2026. And I'm hopeful that for this generation, uh, that we may be able to unite us and, and, and frame a discussion of what the Founding Fathers believed why they believed what they did. Again, this was such, this was an experiment. This was a noble experiment. It hadn't been done anywhere else. And yet it's lasted because people have valued liberty. Yep. And and this the 250 uh, celebration, uh, which is coming up, as you said, uh, right around the corner, uh, it's is that the, the President Trump created the 250 Commission. Actually, the Congress did, uh, and and that's going to be a golden opportunity, much like it was in, in 1976, uh, to, to celebrate one of the greatest stories ever told, and and it, it can be done in a positive way, because every group of Americans has has had their lot improved materially 
over the last 250 years. Uh, th- there's no question about it. every category, if you will, of, of people. And and it's is it perfect? Hey, no, it's not perfect. And does it, is there a lot of work to be done? Of course, there is. There always will be. But this is a chance to celebrate a a, a positive thing, a unifying thing about the about the, what I said, the, the greatest experiments in American history, world history. Uh, so I agree with you. The 250 is a chance for us to coalesce and, and learn more about our country and, and celebrate what we've accomplished as a people over 250 years. Well, let's close with this. You've handled the reins over to your longtime uh, development director, David Duncan. And um, what's next for Jim? What, what do you want to see happen? Uh, what's next on your bucket list of things you want to accomplish? Well, first, thanks for asking. I, uh, I personally uh, believe my uh, my successor, Dave Duncan, is is, is going to do a terrific job. He he worked with me. He was one of the first people I hired 21 years ago. In fact, I hired him on my birthday in 2000. Uh, he's got 21 years with the organization. He knows the organization. He helped me build the organization. He was a full partner in it. So first, I think he's going to do a great job. And, and what I'd like to do, Rick, in the, is I'm going to be on the board uh, at perpetually, or at least until they carry me out and put me in a pine box. And uh, I hope I'd like to participate uh, as a board member and a supporter of the organization uh, in in the coming years, God willing, uh, I'd like to do whatever Dave Duncan wants me to do to help him uh, as a volunteer, because I really believe in this stuff. I mean, I, I told people that, uh, that they paid 21 years. They paid me to go where I used to go on vacation. It was a swindle. Uh, and I just don't want to do it 50 hours a, a week anymore, like I like I did for 21 years. I like to do it kind of on my terms. So the short answer is I, I plan on staying involved with the American Battlefield Trust as a board member and as a volunteer, helping them any way they want me to help. Well, you've done a great job. You've, you've done, and the whole organization has done such a great service to our country in not only protecting land, but facilitating the great stories that I think ultimately those stories lead us to the protection of our liberties and and knowing where uh, where we came from. And then hopefully that points us in the right direction of where we're going. I couldn't agree with you more, Rick. Couldn't agree with you more. Jim, thank you so much today for being with us from the bridge. Rick, thank you for giving me the opportunity to chat with you, my friend. Thanks, pal. Here's my view from the soapbox today. During this summer of both a pandemic and racial and social unrest, Many people have found it appropriate to deface public historical statues and venues or even tear them down. It's a fact that so many facilities were built in this country by slave labor. But that's also the same for the Colosseum in Rome and the pyramids in Egypt or Machu Picchu in Peru and even the Great Wall of China. I hope we don't plan to tear those places down just because they were built with slave labor. Yes, slavery was and is horrible, but you cannot rewrite history. I remember the quote from Ben Franklin. When talking about the patriots, he said, we must all hang together or we will for sure hang separately. If we had lost a Revolutionary War, would Washington, Jefferson, Hamilton, and others be considered traitors today? Of course they would. I think it's virtually impossible to rewrite, rejudge, and redo history, especially from a 21st century perspective. None of our historic figures were perfect. But why are we destroying statues and monuments of Abraham Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt. It simply makes no sense. Probably my favorite book of all time is Harper Lee's classic, To Kill a Mockingbird. Now, Harper Lee had Alzheimer's late in her career, 
and somebody that worked for her found the manuscript, the first manuscript, the prequel uh, to To Kill a Mockingbird. And they went out and they published it. And it's called Go Set a Watchman. And I think it's a pretty good book. Uh, but one of the things that alarmed me was that when people read Go Set a Watchman, they looked at the hero of To Kill a Mockingbird, Atticus Finch, in a new light. Someone actually said, he's a racist. And I said, no. It said in 1952, Alabama, he was a progressive. You just can't judge people then by the way we think now. Let's leave our monuments alone. They remind us of our past, both good and bad, historic and tragic. And that's my view from the soapbox. In honor of our guest today, Jim Lighthizer, let's go on the road with Rick to Jim's home state of Maryland. I love the Maryland Eastern Shore, and one of my favorite places is the Inn at Perry Cabin in St. Michael's, Maryland. You may remember this place from the movie Wedding Crashers. It was the site of the famous reception. The main restaurant there, Stars, serves wonderful Chesapeake Bay cuisine like rockfish, crab cakes, roast duck, crab soup, and oyster stew. This resort is very warm, very civilized, and very welcoming. And the food is as good as you'll get on the road with Rick. Another great show is in the books. Thanks to my special guest, Jim Lighthizer, for sharing the story of the American Battlefields Trust. We'll see you again next week from the bridge.